Welcome again. I want to tell you about some things that I've been researching with the Seminole War. And let me get you this first slide. Okay. I'm going to call this program Alachua Ambush Forgotten Battles of Florida's Second Seminole War. And much of what's quoted or what's known about the Second Seminole War. Uh, the Seminoles consider the three Seminole Wars one long war with uh, a few pauses in between the first, second, and third. Um, but anyway, uh, much of the second Seminole War, which we're most familiar with, uh, and much repeated and quoted, comes from the first two years of the war, from 1835, uh, well, really 1836. 37 and a little bit of 38. And that's about all most people hear about. I do the, did the living history and reenactment programs. And when I first started getting involved, well, it was about after a few years, I wanted to make a timeline of events and battles. And I found record of about 300 battles. Um, but I started getting into research of some things that nobody else was talking about. The battle with the most casualties or the most killed during the Second Seminole War is Dade Battle. And this is a photo of Dade Battle reenactment from 1993. And see Swamp Owl and, and Abraham played by Ralph Smith. And I know a lot of those guys that were in that. But anyway, 108 soldiers were killed at that battle, or around that, three of them survived. And that was one third of the number of soldiers killed in battle in the Second Seminole War. If you can imagine that. Battle of Okeechobee, there was about 127 casualties, I think, um, or 136, something like that. About 27 were actual killed very high wounded casualty rate. Uh, about 800 men were involved in that battle. Of course, we've heard of the Battle of Loxahatchee. That's, you know, the battle site's been saved. So I was documenting the different battles and I came across this quote from 1841. On Wednesday, the 21st, that's the, or I'm sorry, on Wednesday, the 20th, that is the 20th of May, 1840. While a lieutenant and two men were passing between Micanopy and a place called Black Point, they were surprised and fired on by a party of Indians. The lieutenant and one man wounded and one killed. Same evening, Lieutenant Sanderson and command of Micanopy, while on scout with 18 or 20 men, discovered a fire in the woods. On going to see from whence it proceeded, was surrounded by about 50 Indians, Lieutenant S and nine men, three bloodhounds and their keeper, killed upon the spot and four men missing. On Friday, news reached Noonansville that three men were killed between posts 11 and 12. On Thursday, a scout discovered a trail of 100 Indians in Wolf Hammock, six miles south of Noonansville. So this is a pretty significant battle. This would be about number four in the most Americans killed in a battle during the Second Seminole War of 11 soldiers, I believe it says. And that's a significant number. So I started researching these lost battles and events. You know, I looked at that and it didn't even say when it was, who, what, when, and where. Uh, but I found out and I researched the letters of the officers involved in the newspaper accounts and have come up with quite a bit of information on the part of the Second Seminole War that's been forgotten. So after 25 years of research, I finally had enough material that I printed in, in this book and I'll leave a link below. Uh, well, in fact, here it is, uh, bookshop.org slash shop slash Seminole War. And if you buy it from here, you're supporting local independent bookstores. Uh, don't buy it from like Amazon because third party sellers will sell the book there for overpriced amounts, ridiculous high amounts. 
you can buy it at the original price it was intended. Don't get gouged. Buy it here from bookshop.org. Anyway, back to our <laughs> scheduled program. I was originally going to give this program to the Micanopy Historical Society, kind of my uh, launching of my book and do several talks, but that's all been canceled because of the pandemic. So I wanted to do this talk and tell parts of the book, some of it. Uh, there's uh, a lot more that I can't cover. So I just want to get the interesting parts. This is Florida in the 1839 map. After three years of the war, uh, there was a need for a detailed map of Florida. So General Taylor uh, commissions uh, Lieutenant um, by Captain John McKay and Lieutenant J. Blake. Uh, this is the McKay Blake map, 1839. Some of it's really good and some of it's not so good. For example, the uh, southwest coast of Florida, very different than it was actually turned out to be, but that's okay. It wasn't surveyed until much later. In fact, I have an 1890 map of Florida and southwest Florida is pretty much the same as the hand-drawn map from Lieutenant John McLaughlin in 1840. It's 50 years, it hadn't changed, but it soon did after that. But the central part, it's actually pretty good in the map is from uh, what today would be Orlando and north of there. It was uh, surveyed and explored pretty good. Uh, besides commissioning this map, General Zachary Taylor broke down Florida into military districts and squares, 20 mile squares. There would be a fort in the middle. The one we're going to talk about today is Fort Micanopy. This is square number seven, East Florida. Map done by George Thomas, Lieutenant George Thomas. Uh, he came to Florida, was here very briefly, did this map and left. Uh, so there's some discrepancies. I also found that some of the battle descriptions that I'm going to talk about were a little off on description. For example, um, uh, one battle where it says the soldiers went from Micanopy to uh, Weeby's Prairie, it said it took them several hours when, you know, it shouldn't take more than an hour. It's, uh, it makes me wonder if they're really where they're at or if the officers that wrote the reports knew what they are talking about. But, and the reason why I call this a lateral ambush is because most all the incidents in the book take place in what was then a County. Uh, back then, Alachua County included much of North and Central Florida. Today, it would be include Marion County, Levy County, Gilchrist County, and other parts like that. Um, but pretty much everything I cover was Alachua County at that time, even though it's not today. And an important part on this map, kind of in the middle, a little to the right of it, is Fort Micanopy. And there's an eight mile road you can see that goes to Fort Wakahuda. Micanopy for most of the time period I'm cover, covering was the 7th Infantry Regiment was at Micanopy. They're also at Fort King. Fort Wakahuda, that was the 2nd Infantry Regiment. Uh, that was kind of in a different district part of Florida. Um, but anyway, this road that goes between Micanopy and Wakahuda is the bloodiest road in Florida. Uh, more battles and more deaths. And that's kind of what got my interest in starting to explore this. And most of what in the book covers this area of the McKay Blake map. You can see Lake Orange, SNL, and what's today the Ocal Forest. You can see that with the Okawaha River the Withlacoochee River down the lower left, and the Suwannee River here on the very extreme northwest of the map. Well, I had to narrow down my book and to a time period and people and places. 
otherwise there was just no end to it. So I figured I'll send around 1840 around make it OB, a little bit of 4K, cover that part of the history at least. 7th Infantry came from Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. Uh, one of the first companies here was Company A, commanded by Captain Gabriel Rains. Uh, he graduated from West Point uh, about 1827, maybe. A uh, very, very smart officer, 13th in his class. He's most remembered for a Civil War um, time, which is the picture on the left. Picture on the right is much younger, of course. He is famous for, uh, with his brother George, much younger brother, as inventing torpedoes or what we call landmines, submersible torpedoes and shipping channels um, for the Battle of Mobile Bay, the famous phrase, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. It was a range constructed torpedo that blew up the USS Tecumseh in the Battle of Mobile Bay. In fact, the torpedoes that Rains designed were in use as coastal defense up to World War II. So he created a significant part, the torpedoes, he called them engines of destruction. Uh, other people call them infernal machines. Very significant part of history. So. Captain Gabriel Rains, he comes to make an OB, and after a few months, he, his company is sent over to Fort King, now Ocala. And his men keep getting shot at by Seminoles uh, who are picking off the sentries. Another time, the soldiers are going over to Fort Fowl. Uh, they have a bridge, a pontoon bridge, that they're going to pack up and move. And as the company's leaving, two of the soldiers who are guarding the cattle are ambushed and killed by Indians right in front of the rest of the company. Soldiers chase after them, don't catch any, you know. So Captain Rains is tired of this, so he sends an expedition out of Fort King to find and attack the Seminole towns. Some soldiers, uh, Dragoon soldiers, join him from Fort Russell. Uh, so there's a expedition composed of about 35 soldiers go down to what's uh, today's Fort U or Lake Eustis, uh, Lake Harris, uh, Lake Griffin around that area, like, and they find Seminole villages and burn it. Uh, hundreds of acres of Seminole uh, cultivation uh, fields that feed them. Uh, they burn that. They didn't catch any Indians except two. Uh, a man and a woman, the man tries to escape, kills one of the soldiers in the process. The soldiers bayonet and kill the warrior. And the woman, they take back to Fort King. The soldiers also capture 16 horses that the Indians had loaded uh, with packs, loaded with ammunition and shot ready to go, and supplies, food and supplies. Soldiers capture those, take the all that back to Fort King with the woman in chains. Of course, the Seminoles are very mad. Uh, you know, they've been shooting the military. They haven't been attacking the civilians at this point. Uh, but they know where the soldiers live. You know, it's with all those horses and men, and uh, they lead a big path right back to Fort King. Meanwhile, Gabriel Rains, he's developing his explosive device. And people know he used it during the Civil War, but they don't know they tested it out on the Seminoles in Florida 20 years earlier. So Gabriel Rains sets a booby trap out inside the wall at Fort King, actually about a mile, mile and a half away. Here's it explode goes out there, uh, nobody's there, the Indians had left. So he resets the trap, uh, makes it a little different so it's not as recognizable. The next night it explodes again. Soldiers go out the next day. Uh, Captain Marines only has 17 soldiers with him. That's the only disposable force. His company's down to 30 men. That's all he could spare. 
17 is all he could spare to get outside the scout around outside the fort. They follow the trail, they get to a hammock near where the exploding device was. They're not finding anything. Suddenly the dogs are running around barking. And Captain Rain says, what is that? And they say, oh, it's just a rabbit. Then they notice there's Seminole warriors in the hammock and they ambush the soldiers and nearly surround the soldiers. And the soldiers, they, they find themselves in this predicament and take it to the trees. Now, uh, depending on which account, there could be 100 or 200 Indians involved in this battle. And Reigns and his 17 men are in uh, danger of being wiped out, like another Major Dade type ambush. But Reigns is smarter than Major Dade is that he sticks to infantry tactics and he forms a bayonet charge and they charge right towards the Seminoles and Seminoles split and they kill the leader of the Seminole, of the Seminole warriors or what they think is the leader and the fighting stops and they run back to Fort King. Uh, about four men are killed. Captain Raines is shot through the lung. Um, what they thought was mortally wounded. They didn't think he survived, he actually did. And so they survived the battle, uh, but most of the men are wounded that were involved in the affair and the companies pretty much uh, <laughs> retired after that. Uh, another regiment comes and garrisons the post. But Gabriel Reigns uh, survived because he used textbook infantry tactics to fight and not uh, careless like Major Dade did. There were, are two soldiers that are with this command that get separated and are hiding in the bushes as the Seminoles are leaving. They call, count uh, 93 Seminole warriors, about eight black Seminoles, or who they call Negroes, and 20 women uh, carrying off a few of the dead or wounded of the Seminoles. 20 women's quite significant, and this was not at a Seminole village. This was a site near Fort King that this large party uh, came and ambushed the soldiers, and the women had a big <laughs> time participating in the battle. So that's pretty significant. And that was really the most significant uh, battle near Fort King. Involved more men than the assess assassination of Wiley Thompson, which was just <laughs> was very brief. Gabriel Reigns, he's uh, wounded at this point, and he's out of the war for a year. They send him to recuperate at Fort Pike, Louisiana. I figure they must have been trying to kill him because the mosquitoes are horrendous down there in Louisiana. I've been there. I know and after anyway a lot's been written uh, about captain rains after that but very little has been written about a seminal war experience which i cover in my book and also one thing everyone seemed to miss is after the war uh, he he was uh, quite an authority uh he was still writing textbooks on the torpedoes in the 1870s. And so a lot of people in the Army still had respect for gay boy Reigns, even though early on in the Civil War, they didn't necessarily agree with his torpedo technology. And so in the 1870s, he tries to get uh, what we would call pension today. They weren't giving out pensions from the Civil War at that point. But he was arguing that uh, but he could not work because of his health. Uh, he had problems caused by the injury that he received at this battle at Fort King. And he had to fight a very long time. The government's not interested in giving a former Confederate general a pension and says, we don't have anything about the battle, which was a lie because they had all the military records of that battle. It was in all the newspapers. Uh, so there was definitely documentation that he got wounded at the battle, but 
eventually he's given a job at the like a core master depot in south carolina so that's why he has the last four years of life and that's as good as a pension as he's going to get at the time so that's kind of interesting that he's able to get that at that time about three weeks later uh, fort micanopy uh if you think that was uh hot and heavy battle. Um, next one, Micanopy's <laughs> going to be just as fast and furious. So uh, this is a picture of Fort Micanopy by Tom Brady. And some infantry is at Fort Micanopy. And uh, commanding the company is Lieutenant James Sanderson. On uh, May 19th, 1840, which was that quote I mentioned at the beginning, Lieutenant John Martin is coming from Fort Wakahuda. He's about halfway. He's at what we call Martin's Point, named after Lieutenant Martin because he gets ambushed by Seminoles here. Uh, he has three other soldiers with him, two are killed. Uh, Martin and the other soldier make it to Micanopy. The command leaves the fort led by Lieutenant James Sanderson, goes after the Indians, uh, does not find A at Martin's Point, and heads north and eventually gets to an area. Uh, some accounts say it was Levy Prairie. They see smoke from a fire, from fires in the distance. They go check it out. It turns out to be an ambush um, as they're checking out the fire. Seminoles ambush them and pretty much wipe most of them out. A few soldiers survive. And so, anyway, uh, kind of interesting. Let me mention these uh, char characters involved. Lieutenant John Martin, he was in the 2nd Infantry. He was given a commission uh, about a year before, I think in July 1839, is when he received his commission. In the Second Infantry, I have no record of his military background. Before that, he did not attend West Point. If you had good connections and were from a good family, you could get appointed an officer in the Army back then. You did not have to attend West Point. Mark, uh, John Martin, he gets wounded severely from that attack. He asks for furlough. He's not granted it. The general. Armistead at that point commanding the troops said we can't spare any officers. He eventually resigns from the army. Uh, he rejoins the army, the 3rd Dra Dragoon Regiment in the Mexican War. He's not very well liked. He gets in a duel with one of the other officers and not pistols but sabers. The duel is that whoever draws the first blood wins. Martin loses, he gets cut on the hand. And so he's leaving the theater in the Mexican War and he dies uh, before getting back to the US. Um, Lieutenant James Sanderson, very interesting. <laughs> Born about eight, 1798, 1799. As a teenager, he runs away from home, joins the army during the War of 1812. Uh, in 15 years of age, he is in the Battle of Lundy's Lane. He is a sergeant, too. Uh, so quite an accomplishment, not only being a minor, but commanding enlisted in the company. And he is wounded at the Battle of Lundy's Lane, which is the bloodiest battle in the War of 1812. Most of the American staff, many who are later serve in the Seminole War, are severely wounded. Uh, high American casualty rate. In that battle, General Winfield Scott had a piece of grape shot shatter his shoulder. Uh, William Jenkins Worth had a wound in the hip, and General or Thomas Sidney Jessup, the later later General Jessup, he lost a finger at the Battle of Lundy's Lane. So Sanderson was pretty good to get off wounded and not killed. And so when he gets home or gets back, uh, he's discharged from the army because he's a minor. 
When he's old enough, he rejoins the army and becomes the sergeant major of the regiment a few years later at Fort Gibson. The army is short of officers, so he is recommended to be promoted to a lieutenant from every officer in the regiment, um, from the commander of the regiment, Matthew Arbuckle, on down to Lieutenant Neville Hobson, every officer in Fort Gibson at the time signs the recommendation. So he's just a little over 40 years old when he's uh, killed at this battle north of Micanopy at the Seminoles ambush him. With uh, Lieutenant Sanderson is Sergeant Major Francis Carroll. He's an Irishman about 10 years younger. He actually survives the battle, but he's killed a few months later in the next battle I'll talk about. So Sergeant Major Carroll gets to see the guy that he replaced as Sergeant Major killed in battle. You know, I imagine that's quite something. And in my book, I try to dig up some of the other forgotten stories of some of the people, like there's a, a seminal woman named Betsy, they call her Old Betsy. She is uh, over 70 years old. It says that she's known everyone in St. Augustine since the time of the British. The army's trying to get some of the Miccosukee Indians to surrender. They want to talk to How Tustanugi. So they're waiting at the rendezvous spot where they're going to meet him uh, in the Wahoo Swamp. And instead of that, old Betsy comes out instead, and she's quite a negotiator. Soldiers are taken aback, and uh, I think she really, <laughs> she really took command of the situation and uh, come gave gave her <laughs> what her demands, you know. And the soldiers, uh, you know, were not going to pursue the Seminoles and let them come into Fort King or Fort Cork instead. There's another account of uh, two slaves named George and Joe, which is why I have the black maroon on here. One of them uh, was actually, I think his cousin was one of the black Seminoles who fought with Kawakachi. And uh, they were at Colonel John Hansen's plantation north of St. Augustine. I believe that's where Fort Hansen was named after. Um, so uh, the people of St. Augustine, they don't like the Indians uh, being supplied by the slaves, which they believe. They don't know if that's happening or not, but they believe these slaves have been supplying Kawakachi and his warriors who have been attacking everybody. So they put these slaves in prison in St. Augustine while I put them on trial. And it's all in the newspapers and reading all these accounts and then i don't hear what happens it's like what was the verdict what happened did they end up hanging them like they wanted to do but i found a few months later in the newspaper they let them free apparently all the evidence they had was hearsay it was just circumstance substantial evidence um so they ended up not being charged with anything that's interesting but Four days after uh, the battle north of Micanopy where Lieutenant Sanderson was killed, Kawakachi attacks an actor's uh, theatrical troupe going from St. Augustine to Piccolata and makes off with the actor's costumes. Something like 15 trunks of luggage there. And they go have a wild party at a plantation nearby, the Jenks Plantation where they have the plantation owner boarded up and under siege in his house. And Kawakachi has the slaves make a huge feast, cook up all the food for him and his warriors, has about 30 warriors, and they have a huge party. By the time the soldiers get there the next day, Kawakachi and all his warriors, they're all gone. Their soldiers are following the path to chase after him, and they're going along deeper into the swamp, deeper and deeper following the path, and then it just ends in the middle of the swamp. And the soldiers are stuck in the swamp at midnight and it's raining. 
and they didn't catch any Indians. So, <laughs> so, so got some great written accounts there about that. But anyway, the same place that uh, Lieutenant Martin was ambushed at, it's called Martin's Point. And there's another battle there on December 28th, 1840, five years to the day of Major Day being killed on Dade's battle. Some soldiers uh, leave the Fort Micanopy, uh, basically going on a Sunday ride to pick up an officer's wife at Fort Wakahuda. They have about 11 soldiers with them. They're being led up by Lieutenant Walter Sherwood and Neville Hobson. I think Sherwood might have even been the GOAT of West Point, it is West Point class, which is mean the last, last one in the class. Um, both graduates of 1837, really no experience in the field in Florida. They just got to there. Um, they're gonna meet uh, Lieutenant Hobson's wife at uh, Fort Wakahuda. That's why he's coming along. Also with the command is some uh, Elizabeth Montgomery, the wife of Alexander Montgomery at Fort Micanopy. She just, you know, she's friends of the other officer's wife. She's only 19 years old. Uh, they've been married uh, just three months, um, just newlyweds uh, recently in the country. So when they get to Martin's Point, the Seminoles ambush the command and the wagons. Lieutenant Sherwood gets killed. Uh, Mrs. Montgomery, Elizabeth Montgomery, she gets shot and killed too. Um, I always kind of wonder if it was friendly fire, but you know, they claim the Indians, but just from the behavior of the Seminole warriors, they're not really after Mrs. Montgomery, even though the newspaper accounts say that the savages were, you know, <laughs> try, trying to rob her or what raper or whatever but uh so lieutenant hobson is sent back to the fort um by lieutenant sherwood lieutenant hobson he's all afterwards he's court-martialed for leaving the command but you know if he didn't leave they wouldn't get word and find out this was happening so as soon as he gets back to the Fort immediately within minutes, you have 300 soldiers from Fort Micanopy going to the site. And right in front of the command is Lieutenant Montgomery uh, to see what condition his wife is in. And he gets to the site first before anyone else, even some of the Indians are still meandering around the spot, but not really bothering the soldiers or anything. And so as the story goes, Lieutenant Montgomery runs up. Miss Montgomery, she's dying or she's dead. And one of the soldiers next to her, Private Lansing Burlingham, says, I'm sorry, sir, I did what I could, but there are too many, but I did my duty. And he dies right there. And it's the account is printed in every newspaper in the United States at the time. And the reason why is in a war with so much bloodshed and, and misery and no hope in sight that you have this one act of chivalry of this one soldier defending this woman uh, at the cost of his own life. And so that, that really, uh, that really relates to people that the, Answer from the War Department is immediately a, a general point set in Washington. 11 days after the battle, writes that, you know, uh, orders an investigation of what happened and wants to know why infantry soldiers were riding horses. Uh, infantry soldiers are not supposed to be mounted on horses. And, uh, so anyway, that, that was lightning fast to get word to Washington in only 11 days. Lieutenant Sherwood, he's buried at uh, West Point. His father sends down a lead coffin to have it shipped back up north. It's uh, taken care of by the quartermaster department. 
that's in 1841. The next year after the war ends in 1842, the army orders all the uh, remains of officers in Florida moved to buried in the mass grave in St. Augustine. And Lieutenant Sherwood's one of those officers listed. So that says that the quartermaster department and the army adjutant are not talking with each other, that his body was already moved to West Point because the tombstone says sacred the remains. And so the question is, whose body did they remove from Micanopy and move to St. Augustine? <laughs> we'll never know. Uh, Mrs. Montgomery, uh, quite an interesting story about her. Uh, Lieutenant Montgomery met her in Newport Barracks. That was the main army processing center across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio is Newport Barracks. This was the main military enlistment processing center from uh, early 1800s up up until the Seminole War or the Civil War. After the Civil War, I think it was a hospital at that point. But during the Second Seminole War in the 1830s, for this part of the country, the soldiers would be recruited. They'd be sent here, issued their clothing, and sent out to their uh, place, their, their regiment that they would join. There was no basic training at the time, but they'd originally go be processed here. So uh, Alexander Montgomery was uh, doing recruiting, and he met Elizabeth Taylor. Somehow uh, in Cincinnati, her father was the richest man in Cincinnati, had several businesses, a grocery mercantile business, trustee at a bank. He is trustee at the um, cemetery at Spring Grove Cemetery, which Ironic enough, is uh, Spring Grove is also the name of the place near where Mrs. Montgomery was killed in uh, Alachua County. It's so interesting how these. So Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati is one of the first uh, uh, public cemeteries, not connected with the church so much. And her father is trustee, and the family's buried here in the vault. And according to the cemetery records, so is Mrs. Montgomery. Uh, Griffin Taylor, her father, uh, only had like one or two children survive, survive him uh, and it, his wife. Uh, most of their children died and uh, Elizabeth died at age 19, killed by Indians. But uh, Lieutenant Montgomery, he was, uh, he, he remarried. In fact, three years to the day of his first wedding, he remarried Matilda Easton. And to show you, he was, he was not a great officer, but he sure married good um, because uh, Elizabeth Taylor, his first wife, uh, father was the richest guy in Cincinnati. Second wife, uh, Matilda Easton. Her father, a plantation owner in Alabama, uh, had ran the first newspaper, was the quartermaster for the militia and a personal friend of Andrew Jackson. In fact, his, uh, her Matilda Easton, her father, Thomas Easton, his uh, brother married Rachel uh, Donaldson, Andrew Jackson's niece. <laughs> so <laughs> very close connection. So. Uh, you, you would think Montgomery, uh, Lieutenant Montgomery, uh, would <laughs> do very well with those connections, but he pretty much staggered in his military career, not very memorable one. And, but for years, I was looking, you know, whatever happened to him, I didn't even know he got married a second time. After the first wife, I thought that he had died, but I actually found out he remarried uh, Matilda Easton, and they eventually ended up buried in Ontario, <laughs> on the north shore of Lake Ontario, Ontario, in a church there. You have uh, Alexander Montgomery, his wife Matilda Easton, 
and their daughter, Elizabeth Francis, uh, daughter of the second wife who's named after the first wife. And very unusual, <laughs> buried in Ontario. Um, but anyway, I go much more detail in the, into their biography. Uh, I'm probably the first person who ever did a short biography on Lieutenant Sanderson, Lieutenant Montgomery. I think I, in fact, guaranteed I'm the first person who ever did that. But all of that was around area that looks like this. Uh, this uh, Levy Prairie or the Bar Hammock Trail near Micanopy. Uh, south side of Gainesville, north side of Alachua Prairie, a uh, six mile hike around Levy Prairie. And this is a picture I took. I took it in January uh, a few years ago, almost on the anniversary of that Battle of Black Point. So, this is kind of what the soldiers were looking, up, looking at as they're getting ambushed nearby. I don't know the exact site of the Black Point, but I imagine it was kind of like this. So if you're ever walking around Bar Hammock Trail, just uh, think about uh, this place was at one time under a lot of contention. Once again, my book's in uh, bookshop.org. You can uh, buy it here, pause it if you want. <laughs> there, And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. <laughs>